Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp and I'm the Chief Digital Manager of Dataversity. We would like to thank you for joining the latest installment of the monthly Dataversity webinar series, Advanced Analytics with William McKnight. Today, William will be discussing increasing artificial intelligence success with master data management. Just a couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. For questions, we will be collecting them via the Q&A in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen, or if you'd like to tweet, we encourage you to share highlights or questions via Twitter using hashtag ADVAnalytics. And if you'd like to chat with us or with each other, we certainly encourage you to do so. Just click the chat icon in the bottom right-hand corner for that feature. And as always, we will send a follow-up email within two business days containing links to the slides, the recording of the session, and additional information requested throughout the webinar. Now let me introduce to you our speaker for the series, William McKnight. William has advised many of the world's best-known organizations. His strategies form the information management plan for leading companies in numerous industries. He is a prolific author and popular keynote speaker and trainer. He has performed, performed dozens of benchmarks on leading database, data lakes, streaming, and data integration products. William is the number one global influencer in data warehousing and master data management, and he leads the Knight Consulting Group, which has twice placed on the incorporated 5,000 list. And with that, I will give the floor to William to get today's webinar started. Hello and welcome. Hello, and thank you, Shannon. Good morning. Good afternoon, everyone. I want to welcome you to this webinar. I'm William McKnight, as I was just introduced. And on this series, which is a monthly series, I utilize my experience to present in-depth topics with strategies that organizations at the top of their game are deploying. And I've got a couple for you here today. Artificial intelligence and master data management, a couple of my favorite topics. And I'm bringing them together today for us because they belong together. And I've had some experiences that show me or prove to me that master data management is a great fundamental underpinning for artificial intelligence success. And I'm going to share with you some of that information today, and I hope uh, hope it improves your artificial intelligence success, because that's going to be very important to you in the next decade. Artificial intelligence is really going to set apart all industries, and those industries that can conform to it, that can actually get on the train early and often and do some very progressive things with artificial intelligence are going to come out the winners uh, in this new economy. But master data management is part of that. And so I wanted to get into that. First of all, I was recognized um, a couple weeks ago, maybe, uh, in this nice list. Since we're talking about MDM today, I'll mention it. <laughs> it was great to find myself in this list. And uh, if I can help you with your MDM needs beyond this, let me know. Our planet. It's becoming a very different place. Yes, I said planet. I, I didn't start with our company or anything like that. Companies influence the planet, and our planet is where we live. It's becoming a very different place with artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence will be everywhere. AI-driven stores will allow you, which already exists, by the way, will allow you to shop without cashiers or waiting lines. AI will diagnose and treat patients, will manage transportation, and analyze massive quantities of data in real time to do it all. AI chatbots and voice recognition systems will sound like people uh, increasingly. AI will be implemented in robots, robot dogs, and other pets that will serve as companion robots for the infirmed, for uh, people who, who need that and who want that. And so we are seeing all kinds of AI implementations out there in the market. Now, anytime I, I talk about AI, I like to share with you some of, some of the interesting things that, uh, that I come across and, um, and think about. And here we have, uh, this gentleman creates with neural networks art that generates realistic faces of subjects from iconic paintings. So the Mona Lisa is actually of a person. And this is more or less what that person would look like based upon, uh, reverse engineering the painting with a neural network. And I've, I've seen uh, so many of these that he's done and others have done. It really helps bring history to life, sort of a hobby of mine, so I like to do that. Um, in the upper right, you see a painting. It looks like any of a number of paintings, right? Well, this painting actually uh, sold for $432,500. So uh, I guess paintings do sell for that, but 
The thing about this painting is it was created using artificial intelligence. That's right. Artificial intelligence, which just fed a bunch of other paintings of people of the time and said to do a great one, uh, asked to do a great one, and apparently it did, at least uh, according to the $432,000. <laughs> and uh, artificial intelligence is making its way into so many other things, like, for example, uh, the whiskey process takes years, and there's so many variables that go into it. You better get it right. And so by reverse engineering all the recipes out there, uh, we are seeing that manifest, uh, artificial intelligence recipes manifest in that market. And let me play you a few bars of this song. And I'll jump ahead a little bit. Yeah, we don't have lyrics, but uh, nonetheless, a very, uh, very calming, soothing song, I suppose, uh, created by artificial intelligence. And it's creating poems and poetry and, um, it's doing a lot of writing, too. A lot of the journalism that we see out there is actually from artificial intelligence today. So I just want to make you aware of kind of where where things are um, today, in case you're not. Deep fakes, of course. And uh, let me see. I Jump ahead. I don't know who that person is, but. Uh, Someone else will. Okay, that's Barack Someone. Obama. And yeah. That's, but it's not really Obama, <laughs> Barack Obama. It's a deep fake of him. So if you're not familiar with deep fakes and how realistic they are, uh, probably that's something that you should be just so that you're not caught unaware because I think that, uh, that can be used obviously for good and bad. I'll stop there. And then in the upper right, we have Sophia. She is a robot, of course, or I wouldn't be showing her, but she is a citizen of Saudi Arabia and She's famous for saying, I have feelings, too. And she kind of does have, have feelings. Well, she has bits that get flipped based upon the sense I that she is uh, experiencing uh, at the moment. And uh, so uh, she is getting, uh, getting her feelings on. And then there's so many ways to uh, uniquely identify people that goes into these deep fakes and these robots. And... This issue of the MIT Technology Review on the cover here, you can see all the various data points that go into our unique faces, which they are unique, believe it or not. And there's so many other examples. Another one I'd like to, to share about artificial intelligence is there was a movie uh, that de-aged some of the actors, like Robert De Niro. The movie was called The Irishman. It de-aged them by 40 years so that they could be the actors in this movie, but it took years and years to do that, and it only took, uh, well, this was years ago. Last year, it took a YouTube beat faker <laughs> who did a better job with it in, in just seven days of work. So that's how rapidly we're able to exploit artificial intelligence today. Robots can read better than humans, putting millions, millions of jobs at risk. You'll see this manifest in some of the examples that I, I share as we go along here. Yeah, so if you thought that was sort of the last bastion of of humanity, um, let's keep thinking. There are they they do exist, of course, but reading clearly is not one of them. We we get tired. We uh, we certainly don't process information at the same rate, and so on. And uh, that's all getting better. So in legal legal research, medical research, and industries like that, robots are taking over. Sensors are taking over factories. AI will dominate factories soon uh, and begin to serve as teachers, cooks, pharmacists, law enforcement officers, athletes, yeah, and other professionals. Universal translators will remove all language barriers. Hundreds of sensors will be installed in our clothes, homes, and overall environment to monitor us and share information back and forth with us. Medicine, of course, is an area that is undergoing uh, extreme transformation with artificial intelligence. Computing is changing itself. Uh, in we may be running on quantum com computers based upon the properties of quantum physics. Uh, people are controlling computers and prosthetics with no physical interaction. And we may soon be controlling things with our minds and communicating from brain signals. So the uh, nature of reality is changing. And, and uh, by the way, if you thought, well, I'll, I'll at least be designing that AI, 
Um, Google is now teaching AI to play the game of chip design, which obviously pretty involved. So uh, pretty uh, pretty forward there. Uh, I'm a beta tester of this GPT-3, and I am impressed. Let me tell you, uh, just about whatever you want to do with text, it can do. It can abbreviate. It can extend from its library. It can help you out with song lyrics and um, all sorts of things, filling in the blank. Uh, it's pretty smart about that. It takes context into consideration, and it has all these uh, 175. GPT-3 has 175 billion machine learning parameters, so uh, pretty in-depth. This is uh, an Elon Musk uh, property or invention, so that's, uh, I think, the basis for a lot of the AI innovation that's happening today. Now, let's get to our enterprises. Well, maybe I already did. Some of you are in those fields that I just uh, touched on there, healthcare and uh, distribution, pharma and so on, retail. But here's a few more examples of AI in the enterprise today. I want to impress upon you that it's here now and it's here to stay. So maybe you find yourself in one of these examples. I won't read them all, but I'll mention financial fraud detection and reducing costly false false positives, that is really getting dialed in. And it's not because a human anymore is sitting there looking at information that's a day old. It, it's real time. And it's incorporating vast amounts of information, including when it's available, information from master data management. Because master data management is highly summarized information. That is when we do it in an analytical fashion. It's highly summarized. And uh, that's going to speed up. That's going to speed up AI right there at the point of sale, at the point of the person sitting there on the website, at the, at the real point where this is critical. And automation is also in my list here. Just about, I mean, my clients are very uh, innovative in terms of what they can automate with AI. I don't have to think about it. I just mentioned the word automation, and, and we start to go. It is really something else. So here's, here's some more marketing. Cybersecurity, smart cities. Oh, that's a huge use of AI. And think of all the data that it needs. And that's why I want you to start thinking about here as we segue to master data management for AI, which is all the data that these apps need in industry, oil and gas, the data needed to determine drilling patterns, ensuring maximum utilization of the assets, manage operational expenses, ensure safety, predict the maintenance. Any of us that have equipment have those things more or less. And artificial intelligence acting upon great data can be a big boon to that. And a lot of people will ask um, me and others, well, how do I get started with AI? Well, let's we'll start talking about your data. Do you have the data in order in order to do uh, artificial intelligence well? And a foundation element of that I'm going to suggest here as we go along is master data management. Where to look for AI opportunities? In the products that you make, in the supply, in your supply chain, in your business operations, how you design your product and your service set, your design, and your marketing, your approval funnel. These are all places where uh, companies out there today are exploiting artificial intelligence to do better at these things. AI affects the entire organization. It should be affecting organizations from the strategic level, from the very top. From the very top, uh, we should be thinking about artificial intelligence today. We should be thinking about how it can impact all the things I just mentioned and making that happen within the organization. Of course, technically, we need a framework. We need a stack or two. We need the tools and technologies in place. We need the operational processes in place. Talent is hard to find, and it's very important. And we need data, and that's our focus here today. We definitely need data. All, any of these really is a, is a knockoff factor for overall uh, artificial intelligence success, yet I would suggest that data is probably the most important one of all. Now, some of you who have been joining this series on a monthly basis, you may recall, I believe it was September, maybe August, that I gave the presentation on data maturity. And I'm not going to review that whole presentation here today, of course, but my level three which is right in the middle, which is the goal for everybody right now at the least. And uh, that slide looks like this, and I'll just highlight a few things. In my data strategy for maturity level three, which is, again, where organizations need to be today, all in on AI. And I define that with 
you know, a few hundred words, but I think you get the gist of that. All in on AI, not questioning it. Not maybe uh, it's okay to be looking for the opportunities today, but you have to at least be doing that and be all in. Got your stack ready and so on. And also, by the way, since I'm here, since I'm already in here on this slide, saying these few words about maturity level three. MVM is in there. I've got all functions for all major subject areas. That's your goal. All functions for all major subject areas. And I'll help you, I'll help you uh, with that a little bit here today by defining more of what I mean. Starting with this slide. The data to manage. The data to manage for AI comes from all over the place. All right. It comes from our e-commerce systems, our ERP and CRM systems, our IoT systems, of course. That's a huge uh, point of entry for uh, AI data, publicly available data, reaching out beyond our four walls, looking at that data, third-party data, syndicated data, if you will. So all of this data needs to come together and be ready for artificial intelligence. And some of that we're doing a pretty good job of today, I would say, like ERP and CRM data in its respective databases, and also in, of course, the data warehouse. So. There's a lot of data to manage, and here are some more detailed examples. Call center recordings and chat logs, customer account data and purchase history, user website behavior. Some of this data that you see on here may be data that your company is currently treating as sort of temporal. It's here today, gone tomorrow, we process it, we move on. Well, um, I think uh, the future dictates that we still not only just keep that information around just in case, of course we do that, but we exploit it on an ongoing basis. And I am suggesting here today that the outlet for that data is master data management. In other words, when you come up with the analytics for your customer, where does it belong? It belongs in MDM. Operationally, it belongs in MDM. Analytically, it belongs in your warehouse and perhaps other places as well, maybe your data lake. Maybe the lake is fed from MDM as well. I'm not going to get too deep into architecture. I suggest it is actually in most of my architectures. But anyway, all of this data in their respective places, but a lot of this is summary data that we want AI to act with in real time. And we want AI to act with, I'm going to suggest master data management. Not just old school master data management with core data, like what you may see here on my left, but also in terms of what I call empowering attributes, and some call, they, some call these the analytical attributes. This is obviously of a customer, and you can see that the ones on the right, like the propensity to churn, that's not exactly something that the customer would enter in a, in a form for you. That's not exactly something that um, you can pick up from one transaction necessarily either. That's a pattern of transactions over the course of time that go into a propensity to churn. And so that sort of transacting, I'm suggesting, is great to do in Master Data Management and store and make available from Master Data Management. All of these analytical attributes. So if you're just doing core basic uh, MDM, you've solved a problem, great. Pat on the back, you're distributing data across the enterprise, you're, you're serving one copy of the data. That's a big problem for so many companies. So congrats on that. But there's more to come. There's more to do with MDM. There's more value to be had if you get into these empowering attributes. So we want our data to be ready. I say this repeatedly. Get your data ready. Get your data act together. So what do I mean by that? You might say, well, we got it in a data warehouse. Okay. but are you hitting all five of these bullets with that? All right, well, we got it in MDM, but what about these five bullets? Is it in a leverageable platform? Now, I just said data warehouse and MDM. Those are the two big, maybe you throw a data lake in there, leverageable platforms. This is where you need to focus your energies in leverageable platforms, not one-offs, not application-specific platforms, but in leverageable platforms. That's what I'm talking about here today in an appropriate platform for its profile and usage. So is it, uh, are, you, are you shoving graph data, massive amounts of graph data into a relational database, for example? Are you putting a lot of unstructured data into your 
a data warehouse? Are you filling that up with petabytes uh, of unstructured data? Are you putting that in a data lake? Or are you trying to do your financial reporting off of uh, Hadoop, you know, or some such thing? Something that's inappropriate. And I've talked extensively about what's appropriate and not. But for however you define it, make sure it's in an appropriate platform. And if not, I suggest that there's still value to be had if you were to do some reengineering to appropriate platforms with high non-functionals, availability, performance, scalability, stability, durability, and secure. Do you have those high functionals in place? Now we're getting close to data that is pretty ready, captured at the most granular level, not a summary level, at the most granular level. And does it meet a data quality standard? Not as defined by you and I, the data and analytic professional, unless you're, you're in data governance uh, out there, but as defined by data governance, which does imply you have data governance and you have that business input to data. So data is ready when, it's, when you're meeting those five bullets. And master data management is a great platform for helping you meet these bullets. Projects are a series of subject area mastery. This is very important when I teach MDM. I want you in that subject area mindset. So maybe we're talking about customer, maybe we're talking about product, site, whatever the case may be. You have to be an, an enterprise that is oriented to what they are and what that is and how they relate and when each one of them is going to get mastered and how it's going to be mastered and so on. And it's not whole cloth, we're done. Okay, we're done with customer. It, it's ongoing, of course, but there's that huge hump of work that is what I'm talking about. And you might have to break that up, but when do we get to the end of that? And when is it in master data management available, performing, scalable, et cetera, et cetera? So this is what I mean by data that is ready. Now I'm going to suggest that robust MDM, one that meets all the criteria that I just laid out, by the way, is half of the effort for AI success. Yeah, AI success. So. I'm talking in terms of, you might call it a budget or a project um, or an app, okay? I kind of mean, they all kind of mean the same thing uh, in, in context of this presentation. So on the left, you see different, I'm going to just say apps in the organization, fraud detection, a call center chat bot, et cetera. All these are heavy hitters in, in terms of artificial intelligence. It would be hard to deny that any of these you would undertake today without heavy artificial intelligence uh, within them. All right, and on the right, I have some enterprise data domains. Not all, of course, uh, not all for any uh, company because they go on and on and everyone's unique and you'll look at this and go, well, that doesn't apply to me, and et cetera, that's fine. These are just example data domains or subject areas. And th these, these are what I want you to be oriented to within your enterprise. This will help you a lot achieving MDM success. So let's, let's go on and talk about MDM here. It's not an option for AI apps. You might be thinking, well, uh, I can do AI. I'm already doing AI without MDM, so thank you very much. But you'll do, you're doing master data management, but you may not be doing it with a discrete focus on it. You may not be doing it with a tool. You may not be doing it with data professionals. You may not be doing it in a, using uh, all the things we've learned about master data management. You may have cobbled together some master data. Okay, so at some loose level, that's master data management, and that's what I'm talking about here. So you, you either will have an application focus to your MDM or an enterprise focus. Now, I like the enterprise focus, but I uh, frequently do an application focus and walk my way to the enterprise focus, and you may have to do that as well, it depends on where you are in your maturity. With an application focus, your focus is on an application master data needs first. Usually it's a work effort to get to the second, third, fourth, et cetera, applications. Be sure you build what you build so that it can scale so that it can get there without starting over again <laughs> or without massive effort to go from product to, let's say, uh, site or product to customer, I'll use the, the big two, right? So you could also take an enterprise focus, which is a focus on the subject area first. Yes, of course you will have, you will have application customers 
for this immediately, but you don't build it just to serve their needs. And I suggest, you may not believe me, but I suggest that if you take an enterprise focus, you'll be so much better off when you have that first application up and running. You'll be so much further down the path to get having the second, the third, the fourth, et cetera, up and running on that MBM hub, as opposed to if you just take a strict application focus. But hey, uh, I'm not in your shoes. You do you, but uh, you want to get to an enterprise focus. Take a higher chance. You have a higher chance of creating new organizational possibilities, too, if you take an enterprise focus. If you take all the needs of all the apps into consideration when you build out that customer, all the needs of all the apps into consideration when you build out that product, et cetera. Of course, the danger with an enterprise focus is you get all on your uh, ivory tower there on that hill, and you build it and hope they will come. Can't do that either. So I've left a lot of latitude in there, haven't I, for your judgment, for making sure that you make it a success on both counts. On one count is the business count. You, you have internal app customers. You must. But the second is that you're doing the right thing by the enterprise long term in, long term in terms of scalability, that you can move beyond this without it necessitating an entire redo because we did not do it scalably. Either initial focus needs a secondary focus on the other. It's the MDM leadership challenge. That's right. I'm leaving that out there for you, the leadership challenge. Either way, you'll do MDM, but without a discrete focus on it, you may not do it well. So I suggest you do it well, and you do it with data specialists. You do data modeling. You do data integration according to the science of data integration not just winging it. You have data quality inherent in there. You use a tool. You're not just hand coding your MDM. The tools have stronger value propositions now than doing that, and they have for some time. It's just that hump of, it's just that hump that you want to get over of incorporating yet another tool into the enterprise. I know. Who needs another tool in the enterprise? Well, we are going through a time period here in the next, I'd say, probably five years when it's kind of like the accordion is, has, been op is, has been opening up and it will continue to open up. It's going to be more complicated before it gets less complicated. Before we get to that true one-size-fits-all, one architecture, one, dare I say, tool that works for the enterprise, this is still going to be a challenge. It's operational in real time. Let the hub create the analytical and the empowering elements. Let the hub do that processing. Let the hub incorporate your transactions, not for storing and distributing. That's for your data warehouse, your data lake, et cetera. But let the hub absorb that information and glean the intelligence out of it and save it and make that data available, just like that propensity to churn I was talking about a little bit ago. Make it a discrete project with high touch points with an application. There's the conundrum. It has to be a discrete project done with these data specialists and so on, but there should be high touch points with all the application owners. And for this, you need to organize. You don't just want to up and do MBM. You need to organize, and you need to bring business applications into it. Those are your customers if you're building MBM. <clears throat> Focus on the total cost of ownership first for justification. You want to justify MBM? I've tried it different ways. Let me save you some time. It's a TCO play. It's going to save you time in the long haul because you're going to do it anyway for all of these apps, for all these AI apps and other apps. You're going to do it. But can you do it once and build it to scale and have that be the one and done? Or are you going to redo the, how shall I say the analogy, the ocean, and <laughs> rebuild the ocean, reboil the ocean every single time? So build it to scale. It doesn't take longer to consider all known requirements. It really doesn't. We're talking engagement efforts early and often, like they voted in Chicago, early and often. All right. The real decision points, your road mapping around sponsorship. Road mapping means planning over the course of time. When are these things going to happen over the course of the next year or two or three, as the case may be? My crystal ball gets a little fuzzy there. But two or three, I think, is totally appropriate. Sub by subject area, publishers or workflow. Don't forget third-party data. 
who are my subscribers? So publishers or workflow, that's where the data is coming from for MBM. See, in MBM, data comes in and data goes out. That's it, just like any other database for that matter, except it's a specialist database. The data may come in through a workflow that you build or it may come in through a publisher. And then the data goes out. This is where it gets exciting. To subscribers, it doesn't just sit there in the hub. You haven't really done MBM if your data is just sitting there in the hub. Come and get it. No, you need direct links to your customers, your AI applications. Don't forget common artifacts like the data warehouse and big lake and various operational hubs that you may have. And what I mean by that is don't forget to push the data to them. They need it too. That you should not be creating a different customer master in MBM than you have in the data warehouse. It should be one in the same. So if you're if you created the data warehouse first, like most companies have, and you're along your merry way, and then oh, you're doing MBM now and you build a customer in there, that customer should feed the data warehouse customer uh, dimension. All right, how are you going to communicate? That needs to be on your roadmap and uh, bringing in sponsors and governance. Yeah. You see, MDM is data as a service. And a big question, and I'm getting in front of it here for you, a big question is how far does the build team go? So maybe you're thinking I'm on the build team. Maybe you're thinking I'm not a builder. I'm a user. Great. Whatever. I'm an app owner. Then you're a user of MDM. But how far does the build team go? This is so often left to, oh, whatever happens. We'll see when we get there. No. Think about it now. Build a service level agreement for the master data. Everybody wants to know what's in it for me. So if you have an application and you hear, oh, what are they doing over there? They're building master data. What are you thinking? You're thinking, what's in it for me? How do I get involved? How do I get that data in my app? Well, if you're, the, if you're on the build team, you need to be able to tell them that very succinctly. How does that work? And of course, the de devil's in the details and, and the pudding and all that, and it'll take some time to get it all detailed and so on. But you got to have a way, all right? MDM communication and center of excellence. Okay, the build team might do that. Integration planning. This is the big one. This is the big one. I put a question mark here. Actually, I put a question mark on a few because there's no right answer. The right answer is the answer you all agree upon. So is the build team, is it built to push the data into the AI apps? Or is the build team built to build it and they will come? I don't, I don't know. You know, everyone's a little bit different on that. But be sure you know so you don't get to the point where, great, we've done it. And then both teams are looking at each other going, okay, you're responsible for bringing the data into our app. You know, uh, I've seen that happen uh, a few times. And so I just wanted you to be in front of that. Hub model and rule expansion, how does that, how does that work? You know, build team will probably do that. Mapping the elements. This is part of integration. Mapping the elements from hub to subscriber. I've had situations where, and this can work different ways, but the build team does the mapping, but the subscriber, the app, if you will, does the actual integration. Okay, that's a model that works. And I'm not here to say which model. I'm here to say, better make a decision. <laughs> and I can help you with that, or somebody can help you with that as well. Customization of the elements and data quality rules for the subscriber. So you build MDM, but it's not perfect for your subscriber. You know, honestly, it probably never is. Hopefully, you're 90 plus percent of the way there. And hopefully, the answer to that gap to 100 percent most of the time is let me fix MDM. Let me expand MDM so it's right. But sometimes we know the subscriber is going to do it at their end and they're going to exclude MDM, and you're always kind of living in that. Uh, okay, I get that. But who does that work? Every new integration will have some. And uh, hopefully you have solidified your, your MDM hub in the, inter in the enterprise. Hopefully you have established your credibility in the enterprise so that the answer to where does it go is back in the hub, 
back in the leverageable place, the place with governance, the place with data experts. Let's pick on some applications. You got my data domains here on the right from before. Let's run through a few applications and think about this. Fraud detection. A lot of companies are doing fraud detection. It's not just for financial anymore. But what do you need for fraud detection? Now, I'm suggesting a few things here. You might look at that and go, well, we need, we need our assets as well in that. Okay. Okay. Do your mapping. Do you. Do your mapping. Put it on the roadmap. And where you see all of these applications needing customer and product and whatever else, that can prioritize your MDM roadmap, can it? It should. Anyway, fraud detection needs, I'm just going to say, customer, needs your stores, needs your product, needs your contract, needs your policies. I think we, you can see why for every single one of them. But let me ask you this. If you're stepping up, if you're an application owner and you're stepping up to do fraud detection or to take it to the next level, we're all doing it, but take it to the next level with AI in your organization, wouldn't it be great if the customer was already mastered according to my rules from before? Wouldn't it be great if that were in a leverageable platform with an SLA and, and that was taken care of, it was true data as a service? Wouldn't it be great? Well, most organizations, unfortunately, have to say, yeah, that would be great, but, but it's not true. Um, and if they're not thinking about MDM, they're not going to cut off a discrete effort out of the budget to do it, yeah, may I say, the right way or the architecture, architected way with, with MDM. So they'll do a job with it for sure, but it'll probably only, it'll probably only be good for fraud detection. This is, this is where I'm, I'm giving you the warning. Please build these subject areas that are going to be needed uh, throughout the enterprise, throughout the course of time, build it in uh, master data management. So it would be great if all these things are there. It would be great to have customer, product, account, contracts, and assets, and what have you, when it comes to building your call center chatbot. Now, this is a new app for many organizations. Uh, obviously, organizations that have call centers you know, I've had them for quite a while, but adding chatbots is something new. And when you step up to do that, you need a lot of information. And I'm suggesting what some of those pieces of information are. Now, do any of these apps, like the call center chatbot, do they need any of these enterprise data domains to be 100% fully mastered and error-free forever like assets? Um, no. They, they need what they need, and it's probably a subset of that. But it's hard to sit here from a data perspective and know exactly what that is. That's why we want to build to, to the Mac, to the superset, as best as we can. And truly, while you're in there sourcing, sourcing elements from wherever the data is coming from, that's a great time to source more, to oversource, and to get what is necessary for the future as well and have it ready. I want you to be ready. Wouldn't it be, wouldn't it be great? Now, I'm, unfortunately, not too many organizations can say this today, but more and more, it is becoming true that applications such as this new wave of AI applications that's creeping up and becoming very important in organizations today, that they have this wind at their back by having MDM in place with customer ready to go with data as a service to that application. So the application can focus on, get ready for it, the application stuff and not the data stuff. And that is what I would really like to see. Self-driving transportation, if you're doing that, you need some different data domains. Customer, customer seems to come up all the time, doesn't it? That's probably why it's number one or close one B with product. Uh, what else do you need with self-driving transportation type of AI apps, policies, what your policies are, geography, that's becoming really, really important. And this isn't, this is an old geography like what you might get from the post office. This is very in-depth, um, uh, informed by GPS, lots of information on every segment. And here it is again, if you're predicting flight delays. I know I'm getting a little specific here. We're not all predicting flight delays, but we're predicting transportation delays and 
delays and other things, but this is just an example. You need your assets, you need your policies, your geography, and I'm sure if we got a war room and, and sat there for a day, we could find needs for some others. The trick is drawing the line and providing value. Not providing 100% value, but drawing that line and providing enough value so that your, your use, your MDM hub is actually used and valued. And also informed by the app, right? You, some, some, of, some of the MDM owners think that, that uh, if they thought ahead so much that uh, the apps don't ask for more, that that's success. And I don't think it is because there's always more. <laughs> there's always more. And either the app's going to just do it and not tell you and just make it harder for the overall enterprise including data, which is a domain of responsibility for an MDM owner, right? Um, or they'll get it from you and they'll inform you how you can, you can go get it and help them out even more. Again, apps doing app things. What a concept. Okay. Marketing, segmentation analysis, campaign effectiveness. I think you've kind of got the drift of, uh, of this pattern here that I'm showing you, but you need customer, you need product, you need equipment, you need media probably other things. Smart cities, ooh, there's a lot here. Facilities, financials, assets, equipment, geography, of course. And now I threw in citizen. Not exactly customer, but citizen. That's the, uh, the customer of record for smart cities. Supply chain. Yeah, you need a different set. I won't run through them. You need a different set. Have you done this exercise? Have you done this exercise? If so, or if not, it's no wonder you're feeling like, well, I don't really know how much I'm contributing to the organization by doing bill of materials. I don't know. I, I know that they're, they're, uh, they, they're, they're screaming very loud from the supply chain group, so that's why we're doing it. But I don't really know if, this, if, it's, if it's top priority for the enterprise. If you haven't done this exercise, so just do it. Don't let it take very long, a couple of days, uh, and, uh, and keep it active. You may want a council that uh, meets on a regular basis just to keep this active. And this keeps those groups informed, those AI apps out there that are emerging, informed of, of how they're going to get their data when their time comes. Oil and gas exploration. Yeah, I've done, I done, I done this, uh, this app supported this app, I should say. Um, and uh, yeah, it's quite a bit, quite a bit to be effective. This is one of the higher barriers to entry, I would say, from an MDM perspective, but it can and should be done. Doesn't matter if an app needs all of the data domains on here, it should be done by MDM, not an other way. So here is an idea of a roadmap, uh, broken down by quarter. Uh, so the first quarter, and for some of you, that starts today because you're not anywhere yet in your MDM journey. But most people are somewhere in here, but hopefully you've gotten past what I show as quarter one activity, all right? Tool procurement and installation, business prioritization, stakeholders and roles, MDM architecture. Yeah, there's that. Workflow and data flow, MDM lifecycle planning, your MDM ops, if you will. And then you've got phase one customer. Now, what I like to do is for an organization that's immature about MBM is start with one, get going, get ramped up, get the uh, agile team, the scrum team going on that. And when it when it's evident, we know what we're doing. When it's evident that the end is in sight, the light is there at the end of the tunnel, delivery is going to happen, then let's bring on another team and ramp up product. And maybe the customer team will flip to supplier or some such thing. You can figure that all out. But you want to put it on a roadmap. And by the way, data governance, data governance is on here. It's on here for the long haul. It starts on day one. It's not something that, oh, we'll fill that in a little bit later. After we've done customer, we'll do data governance. It really doesn't work well that way. You can do, you, you don't have to do full-blown data governance. And, and I've talked about this extensively otherwise. But. I will say, because they're so intertwined here, that in terms of data governance, what I hate to see are these 
isolated data governance groups where people in the organization don't really know what they do. They don't really affect the app. Uh, but they're meeting some they're meeting some book standards somewhere. Okay. Um and uh they're ticking and tying things apparently. Maybe they're building out the data catalog, but who knows when it's going to be ready for somebody to use, something like that. I'm sorry, I don't mean to be like disparaging of, of data catalog efforts or anything like that. I'm all for it actually. But you've got to stay connected to the apps. And this is what I tell my MDM uh clients, this is what I tell my data governance clients. And we find ways to do that because that is very important. So in whatever you're doing out there, stay connected to the app. Be a big part of it. So when the app goes to production, you're right there. You're right there. And uh, they know it. Uh, they value what you've brought with MDM to those AI apps. So in summary, artificial intelligence applications in the enterprise are about putting AI to work on master data, and we can do a full stop right there. And what I didn't get into much today, but is also true, is if we put, we're putting the AI to work on master data that's built with artificial intelligence increasingly over time. So MDM itself should have many elements of artificial intelligence built into it. So you want to look for that in the tools that you buy and so on. And that completes the sentence here, right? Artificial intelligence apps in the enterprise today are about putting AI to work on master data built with artificial intelligence. That's what they're about. And half the work effort is the master data, and the way to master data is with MDM, as I've talked about it here. So, Shannon, that brings me to the end of the presentation. Do we have any questions? We have a lot of questions coming in here, William, already in the Q&A portion. Um, just to answer the most commonly asked questions, just a reminder, I will send a follow-up email for this webinar by end of day Tuesday, actually. It's usually Monday for this, but uh, Monday is a holiday. Um, so end of day Tuesday with links to the slides and links to the recording. So, William, diving in here, uh, should data governance and the data strategy drive MDM? Should data governance and the data strategy drive MDM? I'm going to say yes. I'm going to say yes, because as I define data strategy, it is that roadmap that cross-references applications that are probably already on the roadmap with uh, data domains. And those data domains, I want to have them mastered as much as possible before the application needs them. But secondly, I want to remind all us data professionals that we're, we shouldn't be sitting here beholden to uh, the uh, application strategy. We should be influencing the application strategy. And many of the apps today, if you will, should be coming from a, a, a base of data expertise. So we need to be influencing the data strategy. But once we do have the data strategy in place, and we do have data governance to some degree in place, yes, that would influence MBM heavily. And how is the uh, operation data store different from master data management? Hmm. I haven't heard that term very much lately. Um, we've tended to not do them in our architectures anymore because uh, we found that data warehouses can be real time. And so there's less of a need for them, but they exist, of course, and there are pockets when they make complete sense. MDM thinking about it here right now, I think it's kind of a form of an ODS, but in MDM, hopefully I've made it clear, there's no transactional data that's stored and distributed uh, from within MDM, whereas an ODS has uh, usually a single or a couple different uh, uh, data sources for it, and, and we're building it for a discrete report or two or three or ten but it's really not meant for widespread consumption, and it's limited in uh, the data inputs. And MDM is neither of those. It's, there's a lot of consumption of MDM data. There's a lot of uh, potential data that can, can end up in there, so it's not limited at all in that way. And then how can AI be used to address data quality issues so this data can be leveraged for AI-centric projects? 
Yeah, yeah. I think uh, I'll start that answer by um, starting with kind of where I finished this presentation, talking about some of the ways that MVM can have artificial intelligence built into it. And I think that, you know, we want to see that, first of all, the way we've been doing data quality for years and years and years, myself included, of course, um, it, it, it's not scalable. It's not scalable to ask the data stewards, you know, for input on 100 different, you know, data elements. What do you want to see here? And let's go make sure that it's true. Um, that has to that has to be automated. And artificial intelligence is the way to do that. So what we see in the in the better uh, MDM tools out there, and of course most of them have some semblance of data quality to them. So they'll apply rules to data as it comes into the hub and before the data is in its uh, in its chute or in the staging area, if you will, ready to be uh, distributed, it is of sufficient quality as defined by the the tool or the you know, parameters of the tool. So I think that um, you want to look for robustness in that area of any tool that you select. Some of you have data quality problems that are too big for an MDM's data quality uh, support. They, they really are. And for that, you'll need a specialist data quality tool. And some MDM tools out there, just to kind of round out this conversation, some MDM tools out there don't really have data quality built in, but they'll sell you a separate tool or there's a partner tool or whatever uh, that's focused on data quality. So, I mean, you want to look at the, the overall value proposition and how much artificial intelligence is built in to data quality. And I'll give you just one one final example here is uh, a big part of MDM is, is those work flows, right? And that's where the data will uh, originate by getting the workflow passed around from department to department. Everybody adds their good stuff. And at the end of the, uh, the cycle, we have a master record. It's a beautiful thing when it comes together. But um, what I hate, and I didn't really get into it in the presentation, but what, what I hate to see is, is for a lot of that, the workflow to be consumed by, and uh, the sales manager will review this and approve it. Um, I want to know what what the sales manager is going to look at and how they're going to think about what they're seeing and how they're going to approve it. And I can build that in. Or artificial intelligence can build that in. So we can heavily streamline our workflows. As a matter of fact, those of you that have MDM in production today, I challenge you, you are going to need to uh, speed up your workflows uh, with, the, with modern tool, with the modern tooling and po modern possibilities probably by 2x in the course of the next two to three years. So be thinking that way when it comes to, you know, what you're going to do with MDM that's already in production. And wouldn't the low-hanging fruit for AI be data governance and data quality? Low-hanging fruit for AI? I think about automation as being the low-hanging fruit for AI. Um, I don't see data governance, I believe it was mentioned, and was it data quality as well, uh, Shannon? I think that's what you said, right? Correct. Okay. So um, I, I don't see them as necessarily apps uh, for the enterprise. I see them as enablers of apps. Um, and so uh, I think, uh, you know, when it comes to AI apps, they are things that are, have a little bit more direct impact on the bottom line of the organization. And most things you can't you can't do well without data governance and data quality. So I think low hanging fruit for AI to me it's it's automating tasks that are that are being done in obviously non automated ways. And so we're looking for those things. Uh, it may be I don't know website analysis. It might be supply chain analysis. In some cases, uh, if you're implementing a chatbot, that's that's all AI. Uh, so, and, and, you know, I went through many different examples in the presentation. I think those are more the, the low-hanging fruit than supporting a discipline like uh, governance or quality, which I just mentioned in the prior uh, answer that they should be supported by AI as well. And you have to go further than that into, you know, real apps that support the enterprise. And do you have any tips on how to get multiple functional stakeholders to agree to ownership of master data management? <laughs> oh, let's just gloss over that and, and <laughs> pretend it's not a problem. No, that's a huge one. Thank you for bringing that up. Uh, it's, it's outside the realm of technical 
uh, uh, architecture and things like that, but it really gets to the heart of MDM success. The question was about multiple functional stakeholders, getting them to work together and so on. Well, I mentioned in the presentation, I like to have a council for MDM. Uh, I like that to be current and future uh, uh, subscribers to the data. Current subscribers, they're going to have issues. They're going to want things. Uh, they're going to need to know what's coming out next week, what's changing, et cetera, so they can change rapidly with it. But future stakeholders, they need to see all this happening in real time, too, so that they can prepare, so that they can know how they can best interact with the MDM hub, so they know we're here, what we're doing, that we are attending to data quality, we're attending to scalability. We're making this data as a service for you. You don't have to go do it yourself. And we've already done customer and product, at least to this level, whatever it is. Uh, and we're working now on assets or whatever, whatever the case may be. We'll have that done in a month, at least to this level. Never complete, right? But you have to be able to articulate what you're going to have done, when, and how, and offer up the possibility of accelerating progress. Those of you that have some success, you may offer up to the enterprise with a straight face the option to accelerate progress by spinning up multiple scrum teams. Those of you that don't have that success, that have nothing in place today, I don't suggest you do that yet. I think you're just creating too big of a risk situation. So therefore, you're kind of saying that the, the dates are are going to be more out there. But I like to offer up that possibility. I don't like to say no. I like to say, yes, if you, Mr. or Mrs. Application Owner, can offer up some more budget, we can prioritize that subject area, and you too can have all your subject areas ready to go, data as a service. So I like to get a council together, have them meet monthly, um, maybe, maybe, depending upon how you've done this, Maybe you can uh, pony this onto your data governance function, because data governance and MDM are hand in hand. And in some organizations, you're just going to upset people by making them come to an MDM meeting and then to a data governance meeting where you repeat half of the same topic. So anyway, get them together, get them talking, create service level agreements, create real documentation, create a portal page on the internet where information can be can be had. Remember. They're thinking, what's in it for me? So tell them up front. Tell them up front. I've done, I've done other crazy things too. I, me I remember once when, this will take just a minute, but I remember once when, uh, when my team uh, put customer into production for the first time and we had a couple apps teed up and they were already, you know, using it day one. Great. Um, but I knew that we had, we're sitting on something special here. Gold, the gold of the organization, right? And so we created a, a banner, if you will, a poster, and we put it up in the lobby. It had our, our lovely faces on it, but more importantly, it had information about what it means to you. So if you, you were off our radar or maybe we knew about the supply chain that we hadn't had time to connect, here's what it means to you. Here's the data that you can have. Here's our roadmap, and here's all the great things that we're doing with that data. And we, we are building this with data as a service in mind. Let's talk. And that was successful at making that MDM program go forward within the organization. So think outside the box, too. And we have a lot of great questions coming in, but I think we've got time for uh, one more here, William. So I love this question. Master data equals chicken, AI equals egg? Yeah. Hmm. Is there a question in there? Um, there's, there's, I'm more looking for a comment on it. <laughs> uh, well, um, hmm, master data is the chick, and uh, I guess it could be argued the other way as well. Which comes first? Well, I guess it depends what, what you believe came first. <laughs> um, and let's say they go together, and uh, you can't. I, I made the point in the presentation a few times. You can't do. AI without master data. You can do AI with poor master data, but I don't want that. I, I, want, I want real master data here in place that's scalable into the future. So it'd be great to have uh, the chicken laying the egg of master data, if you will, <laughs> so that um, I guess uh, another chicken can consume the egg to just completely fully exhaust and, uh, and uh, damage that analogy for you. 
William, thank you so much as always for another great presentation. Really appreciate it. Lots of great questions. Thanks to the attendees for being so engaged in everything we do. But that is all the time we have booked for this webinar today. Again, just a reminder, I will send a follow-up email by end of day Tuesday for this webinar um, as Monday is U.S. holiday uh, with links to the slides and links to the recording for everybody. And uh, that's it. So thank you so much. William, thank you. Hope you all have a great day and stay safe out there. Thanks, William. Thanks, all. Thanks, Shannon. Thanks, all. Bye.